Hey folks, um, I have here with me today, Kevin McDonald. He's a professor of psychology, has a master's in evolutionary biology, a PhD in biobehavioral science. Um, not to mention he's a prolific author. I think that my audience will best know you from your book, The Culture of Critique. Um, right. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's an honor. Yeah, good to be here. I'm emeritus. I have retired. <laughs> oh, my, it is my apologies. The mirror, and there's not... And I'm happy for that. Should be said. That's true. Um, you've been you've been canceled, but we all I mean, admire yeah. your work. There is something and freeing about being. Canceled. What? There is something freeing about being canceled. They can only it, really well, do it, it once. Is. Getting out of Long Beach was a great thing, man. I just they made my last years there just terrible, just awful. Any specifics you'd like to share? Well, I did, you know, um, Heidi Byrich and the Southern Poverty Law Center came on campus and they um, instigated this whole campaign against me and the faculty turned against me and, and um, in a big way. And I got all hundreds of emails, of, you know, from hostile faculty members and and uh, nobody would talk to me and uh, that kind of stuff. But it's no big deal now. I mean, it's, I, I, they didn't physically assault me. Did you have any academic support? Um, well, just very, very little, uh, mm -hmm. very little. And uh, it's probably worse now. I mean, the academic world is completely conformist. Uh, it is uh, locked down, as it were. Yeah. And um, you, you don't have a chance of getting hired or promoted or anything if you, I mean, it's getting more and more. So you have to, uh, you know, like if, if you, uh, design a course, you have to say how you're going to include diversity and inclusion in there, equity and all that. You can't you can't just say, I'm all for that. You have to say, this is how I am, am actively engaged in it and promoting the message. And that's what they do. And I'm sure it becomes increasingly impossible to discuss things in plain language. So you have to develop all these subversive tactics and everything. So in that way, being canceled, it's it's freeing. At least you've been able to do um, your life's work and do the most important work uh, yeah. in this realm. Um, I recently watched a lecture that you did uh, where you discussed the psyche of white Europeans. And I found this this fascinating. Uh, why we're voluntarily committing suicide and mm -hmm. um, the revel or the evolutionary effects of of harsh weather and, and living in ice and intergroup competition overshadowed by individual survival. You talk about uh, paternalism, monogamy, um, and then guilt as this uniquely Western thing yeah. uh, that's being exploited. So is the deep-seated ability to feel guilt um, in the absence of widespread social shame a defect in the Western psyche? Like, what must we repair this in order to avoid subversion? Should we persevere <laughs> in our Western values? Um, is there a way to uphold Western values without them being subverted. So are we just gonna have to abandon this part of ourselves, of our collective psyche? Well, as you say, subverted, I mean, it's, it's exploitable. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, our hostile media lead has done. I mean, they they tap into this. And um, they uh, now we have the critical race theory and it just keeps ramping up. But the idea is that all white people are basically racist, even white liberals, they go after them sometimes. And, um, so yeah, white guilt is is probably the key to our dispossession right now. That, but it's in conjunction with what the the media elites are doing. In other words, that it's not separate from that uh, at all. And then, of course, the academic world, as I was just mentioning, has the same kind of moral fervor going on. But with, you know, I, I published a book in nineteen two thousand nineteen. Um, called called liberalism in the Western liberal tradition, and the idea is, you know, why are Westerners so liberal? Basically, when you know they're they're not so rejecting of foreigners, uh, and and they're uh, open to um, new ideas uh, much more than other peoples are, and um, basically that the idea is that we're not based on kinship; we're based much more on developing these moral communities. We have a sense of social cohesion, but it's based on being part of a moral community where uh, you have to maintain your reputation. I'm a good person. And unfortunately, all the media, all the messages that people are getting now from kindergarten on, and preschool even, 
is you're not a good person. And, and you, you may be a good person if, if you uh, do everything we say and pledge allegiance to diversity, inclusion, and equity. I like to say diversity, inclusion, and equity because the DIE is the <laughs> uh, And, you know, it's that, that's, that's why we're exploiting. Now, you take other societies, they're much more immune to that. Japan, China, they're not going to, African societies, they're not going to be, you know, the Arab societies, you think Arabs are, would, would be, uh, would, you could have media messages in the Arab world that would have any effect that, well, the Arabs had all this conquest and they killed and raped a lot of people. And then they had slavery for a thousand, you know, thousands of years and they did all this stuff and they never, you know, there was never any anti-slavery movement in the, right. in the Arab world. Uh, or in China or anywhere else. It's unique about the West. And, uh, you know, a big part of my, I have a whole chapter on the anti-slavery movement in the 19th century. And it was morally motivated. They just were horrified by this, by slavery and, you know, the exploitation of Africans. And, you know, that uh, it, it, it's unique. Mm -hmm. It's like guilt. And, and, and the, you know, the media then was nowhere near where it is now, but, it is, it was used, you know, they, they had newspaper articles that they got in there and, uh, and photos of, or drawings of people uh, on ships, the slaves on ships and that sort of thing. And there were a lot of writing about it by activists. So that, you know, that, that's where we, we're, we're unique in the world in that regard. And again, it, it is really striking that guilt is only found in Western uh, societies, mm -hmm. Western peoples. Um, shame is very different. Shame is you're worried about what other people think about you, and and you don't want to keep your sort of reputation. But right. guilt is internal. You know, nobody has to be around. You could you know steal something at a store. Nobody sees you. It's ten years later. You could still feel guilty about it, and and um, that's that's the difference there. It's an internalized, uh, and it's very, of course, that's very powerful, isn't it? I mean, um, just a very different thing. In light of the evolutionary basis for white guilt, do you think it's something that we can overcome cognitively? Um, in the absence of, let's say, being propagandized by the media, can we come together and be like, all right, we're not going to do this anymore? Yeah, I think we can. And, and that's part of my uh, 2019 book that, that, that uh, the higher parts of our brain can control the lower parts of the brain. And these moral emotions are part of the sort of evolved emotional system in the brain. Uh, but there are a lot of experimental evidence that people can suppress those things. And right. But right now what they're doing is suppressing eth ethnocentrism. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, they, they did a study where um, subjects were, they, they had to view these pictures of, uh, it was blacks and whites or something. I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, when they were done viewing them, the experimenter told the, the subjects, the, the, you know, the, the results here show that you're, you're racist, you're ethnocentric, you're, you're, uh, and, and uh, so, so then they repeated the thing. And, and when that happened, people slowed way down in their responses. They suppressed that. And uh, those emotions were, were not evident. Um, in that same lecture, I heard you discussing uh, nepotism, and one of the reasons that African nations in particular are so corrupt is this, this cycle of nepotism and kinship, yeah. um, which they value so much more than allegiance to country. And I was thinking about this uh, because I'm always like, what's the point of pledging allegiance to our government? It's, it's so corrupt. Um, is it, well, would it behoove us to... Um, base our in-group preferences on kinship in order to reduce the influence of leftism uh, on the cultural zeitgeist right now? Well, yeah, I think we have to. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but that's the thing about, about African culture is that it's based on nepotism and kinship. And, uh, you know, that's why a big reason why those cultures can't work. I mean, I was just watching this thing on uh, – um, TV, it's a series about, and it's about Africa, and you, you see that. You know, you, there's a roadblock, you got to pay somebody off. You get through something, you, pay <laughs> you pay people every step of the way, it, you know, and, and um, everybody favors their kin. And um, that's just not the way Western societies have, have worked. 
Uh, but we're getting there. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and white people are going to have to shape up and, and realize that that's the name of the game now, and um, favor their own. Mm -hmm. You see some movements for that that you know, uh, people advocating you know banding together to uh, um, for economic reasons or whatever. There's, there's this guy I know who has this uh, this campaign against kosher certification, and, and that's that's the idea that why are we subsidizing these people? And we have to band together and, and try to buy non-kosher products and and um, that sort of thing. And you see that historically. I mean, historically, uh, like in Poland in the 1920s and 30s, they would have boycotts of Jewish uh, economic enterprises like this, their, their stores and that sort right. of thing. All right. Um, yeah, I, I do wonder how much we're going to have to compromise our principles and what we would call Western values in order to kind of get into the dirt with these people because our white guilt has really gotten us into this situation. <laughs> and although I'm not sure um, having empathy for faraway cultures is 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 that much of an inherent defect, we, we clearly have let it go too far. It might even be beneficial to us in the absence of of being propagandized. Yeah. Um, I don't think empathy is is necessarily a bad quality. It has made us made us weak. Uh, we're going to have to become privy to how to prevent this in the future. Um, yeah. But how do you think Christianity or having a, a, a puritanical society has factored into the feeling of white guilt without social shame um, in the past and now? Yeah, I regard the, the Puritan revolution in the 17th century as a critical aspect of all this, that um, they, they were much more egalitarian than the, the previous dominant elites, which were military elites, uh, kings and the aristocracy. Um, they, they're very egal relatively egalitarian. Then you had Quakers, also very egalitarian. Quakers very involved in the anti-slavery movement in the 19th century or 18th century. And um, Puritans as well, but especially in this country, the Puritans were the main force against slavery. Uh, and it was a moral fervor, absolutely. Uh, and they were a dominant lead in this country until about 1950, when the mm -hmm. Jews um, basically uh, rose to elite status in America, and, and that's where we are now. And, and they they, over, they overcame the wasp elite, and here we are. But um, yeah, empathy is a good emotion. I mean, you, you if you didn't have it, you wouldn't. You know, it's good to, for your family, for your friends. Um, for people, you know, like you, but uh, you, you have to put boundaries on it. And white people are relatively less likely to put boundaries on it, to, to put an in-group, out-group boundary. We don't have that as much. We have it, but we don't have it as much. Mm -hmm. Look what happened in, in Germany in the 1930s. I mean, they, they really coalesced as a group. And, and so it can happen, uh, but it, it's relatively difficult. And you see what, you know, 50, uh, 60, 70 years of propaganda have done to the Germans. I mean, they are the most guilt-ridden people in the world now. And uh, they, they can't, uh, they just absolutely cannot resist the Islamification of their, of their society and Africanization. And, um, you know, they're going to be a minority. I mean, it, it's a... It's outrageous, but that's true of all Western countries. Mm -hmm. All Western countries are slated that the traditional white population is going to be a minority in the lifetime of a lot of people like you probably. And, and uh, it, it's, it, it's just absolutely, you know, it's mind-boggling. See, in 1924, we did enact in, in 1924 immigration law. We biased immigration to Northwest Europe. Um, and there was a, you know, at that time it was very, very respectable to have racialist views. In the media, in the academic world, uh, prominent magazines, popular magazines, uh, but uh, all that's been thrown out. Mm -hmm. that, that was, that was um, they overrode President Truman's veto in 1952. They kept it there. It wasn't until 1965 when the revolution went out. The 1960s is when it really went to hell. And uh, we're suffering with that now. It's been so effective, this diversity and multicultural uh, campaign in the United States, because I look at leftists and I'm, I'm racially aware. I look at white leftists and I'm like, I have nothing in common with you. 
at all. Just, yeah. I, and I'm supposed to, I understand that in-group preference is important, but I look at these people and I'm like, what world can I make with you? Yeah. Right? And we have no kinship at all, at all. And these are people that, that share the majority of my heritage. Um, so do you think it can be overcome? I mean, what does it really help us r right now to, um, no. to have an in-group preference for especially leftist whites? No, leftist whites, uh, you know, if, if and when we get power, which at this point seems like a pipe dream, <laughs> uh, it does. I mean, I, I know, I, I, I know, I hear you. Power, just massive power arrayed against us. And, and I'm thinking, you know, how can we get out of this? You know, when you think of the uh, the money, just the money that's arrayed against us, uh, uh, trillions of dollars in, in private hands in these mm. NGOs that are totally uh, yeah, so anyway the power is against us but uh, economic but, collapse is a great equalizer and, and, and that and, you know <laughs> we may be heading to that i think the biden administration is really going off the rails on mm. that. and um you know they a lot of people are predicting recession and uh disaster at the polls for the democrats and you know the, one of the, some of the studies i cited in, in in the 2019 book were studies showing that when white people feel threatened when, when you're told when you tell white people you're going to be a minority soon uh they get more conservative they they get more restrictive about immigration they get you know they start thinking that's a threat and, we, and it is a threat you know i mean it, it's a it, it's so naive for white people to think that we're going to be treated as whites as well as we treat these people now you know but we're not oh we're so no, no 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 white hate out there do you think that's going to stop in a day? As soon as, as soon as uh, um, whites are a minority, they act as if that that's it. Right. Once whites are, once white power is gone, you know everything will be wonderful. It won't be wonderful, and whites will be victimized like crazy. It's so preposterous, especially because other cultures don't have this level of empathy. And I always direct people to look at uh, the history of of racism, racism uh, towards yeah. Africans and China. Um, if you're African and you go to China right now, people won't do business with you. They won't touch you. They'll ask you why your skin is dirty. They won't let you touch anything in your shop. Uh, there are only 60,000 Africans and they all are basically uh, relegated to this area of Guadong. Um, they don't do any exchange student programs anymore. The Chinese deeply dislike Africans and they think that they are just lower on the scale of humanity than other people. And I think that this is true of almost any Asian nation and right. Africans are the same way. And to think that we, the people that tried to end slavery all over the world um, are the most evil, that that what we've done uh, with all of our with all of our paternalism and these sure. third world nations and everything that we've brought them are evil. It's such a stupid concept. Yeah. Um, what do they think that our, our country is going to be like? Is it going to be this utopia? Or are we going to descend into some kind of third world <laughs> hell? Obviously, that's what's going to happen. What's going to happen? You're going to have corruption, mm -hmm. nepotism. You're going to have incompetence. You, uh, you're going to go to the post office. <laughs> I was just talking to the guy, uh, actually Sam Dixon. He's a well-known activist. And he's, he's, he goes to the post office. He doesn't know when it's going to be open or closed anymore. Because <laughs> they're, they're just going to make up their own hours. You know what I mean? Right, right. And this is in Atlanta. And, and you know, they, they, it's just it's just one thing after another like that. Mm -hmm. It's going to get worse. It's going to get way worse. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I recently heard that United Airlines is uh, doing an aggressive diversity initiative yeah. where they're hoping to get more black female pilots. I'm like, what could possibly go wrong? At this what? point, if I got on a plane and I saw that my pilot was a black female, I'd be like, all right, I'm not I'm not flying on this. I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm yeah. not doing this. Yeah. I'm not dying in a plane crash today. So we're going to yeah. see things like that happening. Um, Notre Dame, although I think it was probably some sort of terrorist attack. Uh, it's possible that they just had some diversity hires working on the maintenance <laughs> and things like that. Um, yeah. We are going to see a lot, a lot more of this. And if, if it's not going to serve to wake up normies, uh, I, I don't know what I can even do anymore. I'm just so exhausted. You must, you must be much, much more exhausted than I am. Cause you've just been <laughs> singing into the, into the wind for many years. I've been doing it for a long time now. And, and, uh, I can't say we've made a lot of headway, but <laughs> you've been proven right over and over and over I know. again. I know. Yet, um, you know, uh, you can't get the message out into the, the big media. 
and that, that's one thing I think if we if we could just turn around and get the media on our side, but of course it's, it's totally dominated by people that hate us. That's you know, true. We'll, we'll hope maybe Elon Musk can buy Twitter and make it more free or something, but he's not really on our side. And I, I, uh, you know, I was just thinking one guy with say two hundred billion dollars could really change the world, but I didn't even know about that because you know as soon as he as he was going to buy Twitter. They were doing all these investigations into him, you know, and, and uh, Security Exchange Commission and um, all this stuff going on. And I had the feeling that just about anybody's vulnerable, even if they got that much money. That's so, true. But yeah. I always think if Tucker Carlson and Joe Rogan got together and then they went live on their shows and all they said was, you should read the culture of critique, um, <laughs> then um, I think that the world would be in a different place. I mean, there are people with this kind of money. Yeah, and, and Tucker Carlson is the best of a lot on the, of the talking heads on uh, cable news. But yeah, he doesn't go at certain places. And, and uh, he has talked about Jewish hypocrisy, really, with the ADL and their attitudes on immigration. I really like that. Uh, he talks about white replacement, but not usually just replacement. And, and the emphasis is as much on black replacement as white. Eh, that's not so bad. But you just got to at least say that that the that the, the the traditional electorate is being replaced, and that is undeniable. That's why they want all this immigration. Uh, it's just. Um, I did want to switch gears a little bit because I'm I'm really interested in in Freudian theory and psychoanalysis, and I know you've studied this and, and discussed it a lot. Um, it's it's so preposterous on its face uh, for most Freudian theory that I'm like, yeah. how has this been allowed? <laughs> into our society and and people really still do buy they buy dream theory they buy the oedipus complex and all this ridiculous stuff it totally has permeated our culture so i guess my first question is is freudian psychoanalysis all a subversive attempt to introduce sexual degeneracy in a gentile culture in a more pathological way or is it just a cope <laughs> to explain freud and um people like him, uh, to explain their complete absence of inherent sexual morality? Hmm. Well, I, you know, it certainly has been subversive. And I think it, it was intentional. He, he knew it was going to be intentional. He, he, you know, he's living in the Victorian world. It's very strapped down sexually. And, um, it, it, you know, you had uh, intense emphasis on family values and all that. And, and uh, it, was, it was basically a very adaptive culture, family-wise. Uh, um, and uh, he, you know, he says at one point, uh, we are bringing them the whirlwind or something. You know, in other words, he he knew that what he was doing was revolutionary and uh, subversive and and sexualizing everybody. And now we're up to sexualizing little kids. Uh, you know, the trans the transgender is extremely aggressive and disturbing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. What? And so disturbing. It's, it's, yeah, it's very disturbing. I mean, it, it really is grooming these kids. Mm -hmm. Going in there and talking about sexual identity, a four-year-old, five-year-old, eight-year-old, it's ridiculous. And and uh, it, it's inconceivable that this is anything other than a propaganda campaign. And they want to get them young. And so many children are gullible. And they want to keep parents uninformed. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And there's a, I just saw something on Twitter the other day that there, there's this LGBT plus thing from some school system, but parents are not allowed uh, <laughs> to have any, you know, do you believe it? I mean, uh, the parents, and, and that's the whole thing. They want, they, they want, they have, you can have abortions without parental consent. You can have hormone therapy without parental mm -hmm. consent. You can I, have all kinds of puberty delay, all that kind of stuff uh, without parental consent. Now they want to get rid of parents. They want the state to control children, just like in the Soviet Union. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. I mean, uh, they, they don't want parents intervening because all those old fashioned religious beliefs and uh, other things that wanting grandchildren, God forbid, you know, is, is just something we got to get rid of. And, and, and encourage, and especially these young girls, they're, they're so susceptible. Uh, 12 year old girls, so many of them now are, tra are transitioning to be boys, taking these hormones, they'll be sterile, they'll be unhappy. They, you know, and, and it's going to have medical problems down the line. It's, uh, 
girls are more susceptible and they're more gullible. That's true. That's true. Um, and it has happened. It's been so aggressive. It happened so fast. I graduated high school in 2006 and at my giant high school, 2,500 people, we had like your handful of closeted gays, like two gay people out, maybe like your handful of softball lesbians, yeah. no transgender people. Yeah. Um, and then I read some study a few weeks ago that, that 9.2% of 13 to 15 year olds right now identify as, you know, on some spectrum yeah. of the LGBTQ, BBQ, whatever. Um, I see even higher percentage. I bet it's it. even higher, right? It, it, it goes up every year. Mm -hmm. I know for people not to recognize this, obviously as aggressive propaganda is, um, yeah. they, they must know, they must know. I, I, I'm tired mm -hmm. of, of being like, people are stupid. I think that there's more malice than I previously wanted to admit, um, especially within school and collegiate administration. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of psychoanalysis, uh, do you think that, that that is the root of modern gender theory and widespread gender dysphoria? Do you think it was the Frankfurt School? Uh, uh, what do you think played the largest role? Well, uh, the Frankfurt School used a lot of psychoanalysis in their analyses. I mean, if you look at their book, The Authoritarian Personality, half the chapters were psychoanalytic. And what that meant was they, they could interpret anything any way they wanted. You know, it, it, there were no boundaries on it. They, it, you know, if, you, if on the surface you saw really good parent-child relationships, uh, but it turned out they, they, they seemed a little bit ethnocentric. Well, then we could interpret them as a, as a displacement for un suppressed anger. And hostility. <laughs> but that, that's the way they think. So and, and, this, and this is in this incredibly, uh, you know, high level, respectable uh, psychology book, mm -hmm. you know, that was published by the American Psychological Association and, and funded by them. And um, fu funded by the American Jewish Committee, I believe. And, and um, anyway, anyway, it was, it was, uh, that's the thing about psychoanalysis. You can get anything you want out of it scientifically. But yeah, it did. It did. And and it, it produced, I think ultimately things are way worse now. I don't think Freud would endorse all this stuff necessarily. But um really it's gone way off. I mean, way beyond that. With well, he probably he, he might. Certainly some of his disciples like Wilhelm Reich. I mean, these guys were totally into, you know, um, uh, was his orgone box and and you have to release your your sexual energy and and uh, <laughs> or you become violent right yeah and exactly and i when i was in at, at the university in the 1960s i knew people who were totally into this they were building orgone boxes <laughs> i'm not i'm not kidding <laughs> and, How bizarre and, yeah yeah they believed in it man it was like yeah and and but i you know one of the big themes there is that it's led to, to a sort of uh, uh, degeneracy of the society as a whole. That 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 uh, what, what's happened is is a dissolution of the family. Look at the the you know the percentage of auto wedlock births, for example, and do it by race. Say around 1960 on, and you see 1960 divorce was very rare, uh, uh, births unwed mothers very rare, uh, and it starts going up. And there's the racial difference, but blacks are relatively low compared to where they are now. Mm -hmm. This has really impacted the black community, if anything, way worse than the white community. But the white community, too, has gone way up. And so you got all the you – know, every psychological study – I taught child development for 30 years. Every psychological study shows that divorce and single motherhood is not good. They're, they're not good for children, that these children end up – you know, having problems, all kinds of problems, and especially not doing well in school mm -hmm. and, and uh, discipline problems and all these things. And um, so it, it is going to inhibit their upper mobility, their ability to really deal with our culture and its demands for education and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the, the when sexualizing culture like that. In the 1960s, as I say, is a revolutionary decade, and that's when they got rid of. They made divorce a lot easier. They made um, welfare it was such a big, a good deal that you could have children out of wedlock, no problem. And especially in the black community, I mean, men aren't around. Right. All right. And, and so often now in the white community now, and 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 what's happened is lower IQ people. 
the thing about lower IQ people, they can adjust to our society, but they need a lot of social support. Mm-hmm. It's happened since the 1960s. They wiped it out. All the social support is gone, whether it's religion, whether it's the schools, everything. And and so these people are set adrift. And uh, drugs are the size of wash in drugs. Oregon, where I just lived until a year ago, right. uh, has just legalized all the drugs, basically. Yeah, and uh, overdose deaths are way up. What a surprise. And, and over, yeah, what a surprise. Mm-hmm. Overdose deaths are way up. Mm-hmm. What are they trying to do? It does seem like they're trying to destroy us. They are, but perhaps this will be the undoing of um, every insular group of people, even those that introduce the, these kinds of these kinds of policies yeah. and belief systems. I mean, I don't think that um, that this is not permeating Jewish communities as well. To some extent, yeah. But one of the right. things that I have in the, my chapter on psychoanalysis is that higher IQ people are better able to withstand all that stuff. And, and uh, they, they don't need as much social support. Uh, when they get divorced, they, they can keep good relationships with their kids and, and, and they can smooth those things out. And, and uh, they, it doesn't have to be terrible. Right. Um, and, and that's what we see now. I mean, uh, you look at the, uh, at the opioid problem. You know, I mean, that is just an absolute disaster. But once again, it's the people at the lower end the the white uh, Appalachia and those kind of communities that have been just devastated with this stuff, mm-hmm. and I, I you know the, the Jewish pharmacy, um, Purdue Pharmacy, uh, was, is really at the root of this whole thing. They were the ones that did the fraudulent study saying well, this is not addictive, or, mm-hmm. and you know we have to do everything we can to manage pain. But you get some headaches, take an opioid. Right, right. You know I mean, and Doctors are responsible too. They knew that opioids yeah, were are. addictive and then they just overlooked. They just trusted trusted the science and then still they prescribed them to their the patients. Science. They also um, got paid off by Purdue. Right. You know, right. vacations and all this stuff. Hot and pharmaceutical you, reps, yep. Yeah, yeah. Pharmaceutical <laughs> reps got, got big bonuses. The doctors they, they uh, sold to got bonuses. It was all... Yep. That's how it goes. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, of Christianity, I know that there is this, uh, there's kind of this fissure on the dissonant right between uh, pagans and Christians. I'm Catholic and I'm, I'm, I'm being told all the time, like you have bought into this Abrahamic religion. Uh, like, what are you doing? Pe- paganism is the religion of your ancestors. Don't you want to go back to your ancestral roots and everything like that? Um, and I think that right now, pagans and Christians, we're doing a fine job of getting along because we have to circle the wagons. So we're like, sure, we've got enough in common. But in future, I I don't know that we're going to be able to overcome this. It is a huge difference in philosophy. So do you think that Christianity, um, historically, uh, in the United States, particularly in the 18th and 19th century, um, fortified our moral culture? And could it could it do that again? Absolutely. And, and a lot of times in... in- European history, Christianity, uh, you know, defended the West, you know, mm-hmm. against the Muslim <clears throat> invasion. You know, but it's gone woke. <laughs> yeah, they were not, totally not woke. Uh, you look at the at the Reconquista in, mm. in Spain. They were, were not totally woke. Motivated no, by, by Christianity. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, and it was a strong moral code, which is basically adaptive, mm-hmm. you know, for families. Uh, and uh, that's what was destroyed by psychoanalysis and these other movements of the 20th century, and mainly, I mean, the Jewish movements, and then the Jewish more movement for pornography and the whole the whole thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think there's a role for Christianity, and the, the fact is, I, I would hope people could get along as long as they're on the same page of white survival. Um, and I, you know, there are like I. Uh, I edited the Internet Journal um, Occidental Observer, and we had just posted the entire book of Giles uh, Corey's book. It's called The Sword of Christ, and it's a, a, a poly, apologetic for uh, Christianity and and uh, you know its its historical role and um, its attitude towards Jews and, and all that sort of thing. As and and so there there it certainly can be intellectually reasonable defenses of Christianity. The problem is, of course, and he's acknowledging that in the contemporary world, uh, the Christian 
prelates and the bishops and all that, and the priests, every, everybody, they've been completely taken over by this leftist ideology, and they're just That's part true. of the problem right now. Do you think that some of it is is baked into the cake? Uh, I know with my Catholic teachings, like I, I, have, I have a really hard time with uh, this this concept of unconditional forgiveness. And yeah. then there's just not enough, um, there's not enough validation of extending your wrath on this earth. Like, <laughs> like yeah. we have real reason to be extremely angry. And a lot of people have told me, you know, Christianity, it, it makes you cut. It makes you forgive your neighbor. It makes you uh, vulnerable to things cheek. like turn the other cheek, right? And and I do have a big a big problem with that. But then I look at the historical precedent, and I'm like, it, it hasn't it hasn't always been this way. So if no. we return to a fire and brimstone type Catholicism, can we use that to resurrect the Western nations of the past? Well, yeah, I, I think the only the only kind of form of Christianity that could rescue us would be that kind of Christianity, you know. Um, in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, Christian Europe, well, Europe became Christian. It was converted, but uh, that was a tough, tough job for the, for the missionaries. <laughs> because, you know, these guys were, had really a totally militarized culture. They, they, were, uh, they were soldiers. They, they were uh, um, yeah, definitely uh, uh, on, on page with, uh, you know, they, it, it was, they had these military elites everywhere. And, and Christianity basically made its peace with that mm -hmm. and, and, and made its peace with warrior culture. It can, it can, it's fungible. You know, you can, you can change Christianity uh, to, to suit the times. And that, what we need now is an ethnically racially conscious Christianity, obviously. And, and uh, it can be, it can be rationalized on the basis of text, I think. Um, do you think that that secularism is the real culprit here um, in the absence of the Frank Frankfurt School and, and Freudian psychoanalysis and, and other efforts like that? Uh, do you think that they would have been so effective in um, a religious society? Did they destroy the religion before they introduced these ideas? Yeah, I think that that uh, these ideas were ultimately um, Involved in destroying the religious basis of the of the culture. I mean, if you look at the media, just all the making fun of of Christians and uh, hostility towards Christians, either you know the hatefulness, but also uh, making fun of them. And uh, you know, I, I've written some material on that, especially in the preface to the culture of critique in the 2002 paperback edition where you, you can't find a movie, you know, since about 1970 or so that is positive about Christianity. Really, <laughs> There used to be a lot of them, but uh, what, what they have now is, you know, a priest that turns out to be some kind of horrible person, you know, and uh, of course you never see that. With, with the rabbis, even though that is quite common. Among right, them. right. They do this with pedophilia constantly in the Catholic Church, yeah. although there has been more pedophilia within the Jewish community and within the public school system, and no one ever talks about it. They just yeah. want to talk about these pedo priests. Yeah, yeah that's right. And then and the Orthodox community, the Orthodox Jewish community, it's, it's rife mm -hmm. there. These, guys, these, these rabbis have so much power in that community, and they, they have exploited children and other people, and uh, but it's, it's suppressed, and uh, sometimes it comes out, mm -hmm. but uh, not that often. So you were perhaps the most canceled and vilified person that we could call dissident, right? I don't know. Maybe, maybe David Duke has you beat, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, you've really we've really gone through the ringer, and I think that that gives you um, a unique perspective on what we're up against. I was wondering if you had any advice for people that are going through um, this process of getting canceled, of, of not just losing, losing their livelihood, but losing their social network, um, losing losing their homes, losing the places that they grew up, losing their support systems, their churches even, because uh, it's not just it's not just your job. Sometimes when this happens, uh, your community, like you talked about at the at the top of the hour, um, your community abandons you. So, what would you say to somebody that said something about black people on or you know on Twitter ten years ago, and then their boss just found out, and suddenly they're a they're a local pariah? Yeah. 
Well, it just shows you have to be extremely careful now. I mean, I, I think losing your livelihood uh, is extremely problematic. In my case, I really had no excuse because I, I had tenure. Right. And I knew that unless I did something criminal, basically, I, I uh, they couldn't fire me. And, uh, <laughs> whereas that's not the case with so many people. Right. So I advise people. I say, use a pseudonym. Stay undercover. Don't expose yourself. Because they want to see you begging on a street corner mm-hmm. for nickels. Right. They would love that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they want to absolutely destroy you, destroy your family, and everything about you. And um, so, because th- there's that hatred there. You talk about Christians not being willing to hate. Well, Jews are willing to hate, and 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 they and, and you know what? <laughs> I include this article um, in in one of my. Uh, it's it's going to be a well. It's on Axel Quarterly and Axel Observer. I think. Um, to the fact that uh, it, was, it was an article written by a Jewish guy saying the virtue of hate and, and just having all these examples from Jewish history, Jews hate their enemies and, they're, and they have no compunctions about absolutely destroying them. And so you come out to someone like me and do anti-Jewish writing and stuff like that. Well, you got, you got a problem on your hands. And uh, yeah, I was run out basically run out of California and my wife got in trouble with her friends uh, who were, you know, sort of on the left. And um, they were, uh, you know, we worried about picketing the house and all that. And then we went to Oregon and the same thing happened only with me. <laughs> and um, again, they're anti were around and, and uh, there's a, a real danger, you know, they, these people don't shy from cracking heads and, um, so, and, and just the, you know, the unpleasantness of having people picketing your house. I, I feel more secure where I am now, and, and not, I'm not worried about it much because even if uh, people know about it, I don't think I'll be victimized. That's true, yeah. But there's value <clears throat> uh, for your soul, for your sense of inherent morality to to live your life telling the truth. And no matter what happens in my life, it's like, well... At least I tried to do something about all this. And then I think about our ancestors. You know, they were getting their feet blown off and living in trenches and just doing horrible quality of life, depression era, life, things like that. And I'm like, someone said something mean about me online. Ooh. Yeah, so it, it, that said, helps me. You know? All of our ancestors lived horrible as compared yeah. to us. And now, I mean, we, we are relatively wealthy and everything else. And, mm-hmm. Um and I, I sometimes say, well, what if I hadn't gone this route and just in the standard academic thing? And where would I be now? I'd be retired for 10, 12 years or whatever. And uh, I would, uh, you know, I would have no my academic life would be over. Everything would be over. And, and you so, never would have reached the influence. And I never your would book. have told the truth. Yeah, and the truth, yeah. You know, and, and that's what, what happened with me. Is I, you know, I didn't have a, a lot of people become anti-Jewish because of some personal experience. Somebody ripped them off or something. <laughs> I but like that, how you just go to that. <laughs> it's not me. I mean, I, I, I really did. did be, I became uh, the way I am because I, I read a lot. Mm-hmm. And, and I just realized these people are not on our side and, and they're, they're really trying to undermine us and um, go against us. And not all of them maybe, but where the power is, where the money is, yeah, it's directed against us and it still is. And um, they are a dominant elite now. Mm-hmm. There's no question about that. And uh, sure, they're non-Jews in the elite, but they, they, all, they really all – you know, toe the line on this. You know, someone like Jeff Bezos is not Jewish, I don't think. Some people think he is, but I don't think he is. And and uh, he um, he advises the Washington Post. He's always left wing ideas. They're not going to buy on him. That's true. I mean, I I think for your average leftist, there's just so much social pressure to be yeah. pro diversity, and the average person um, just doesn't have the ability or the endurance to kind of weather the, the storm if they get canceled. It is, it is a jarring experience. Um, and I just don't think that people can handle it. And so it's just easier to be like, 
yeah, whatever. Um, legalized drugs. I don't care that I have to step over needles going to work or because it's all easier than all of my friends stopping talking to me. <laughs> yeah. There's so much pressure. It, there you is know, so much pressure. Mm -hmm. The average pressure can't, the average person can't deal with it. And they fall in line. And um, I mean, that's what, that's, that's the safe move mm -hmm. is to do that. And um, women are more concerned about safety than men in general. And there's strong evolutionary reasons for that. Um, and so women, uh, you know, become, they become conformists more, more so than, than men, but most men too now. And uh, it, it is pathetic. The, what we have is emasculation of men, really. They, they are, are um, uh, wimpified. <laughs> they just, uh, I mean, you see it. Actually, you look at some of these studies showing the decline of testosterone. And over, sperm count, right? Sperm count over the decades. Uh, a lot know. of people attribute it to endocrine factors, but it, it's happened so rapidly. I yeah. think a lot of it's obesity. I think a lot of it is um, single motherhood. That has a, a, a very profound effect on testosterone. But I think that actually what we're being fed through the media is reinforcing this decline of testosterone because men aren't engaging in oh, any yeah. kind of competitive practices anymore, <clears throat> which boost your testosterone. So they're not really playing sports. They're not, I don't know, when I was growing up, it was like every week there was some dude kicking some other dude's ass in the parking lot at my high school. <laughs> and that that was great. <laughs> it was good. It's good for boys to do I this. In grade school, I don't think in high school, but we used to fight all the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that I think that that's good for boys. And now that they have this, uh, that they're treated like girls, where they have to kind of sit in a classroom all day and they have to be yeah. polite. And then there's no competition, there's no violence, and we've just removed the sport of it's being a man. Mm -hmm. It's much harder for boys to be part of the classroom, and you know, boys have this tendency towards hyperactivity anyway, and real energetic, and mm -hmm. um, it's, so it's difficult for boys, but. Um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, the school system is, I mean, man, the boys can't, I always adjusted to it quite well, uh, but, uh, some had much more difficulty, <clears throat> and, you know, I think 60%, 65% of college students are now women. <clears throat> I, I can't see how this is possibly going to go wrong. Having more women in positions of, of leadership. <laughs> Right. Good Lord. And it used to mean something to go to college. You had to be in the upper echelon of intelligence, but now it's, it's just like any, any idiot can get some kind of college degree. It doesn't mean anything anymore. I was listening to some um, Stanford, some black kid from Stanford talk about uh, like systemic racism in Stanford. And, you know, he was speaking straight Ebonics and I'm listening to him. I'm like, this is, this is a modern Stanford student going to Stanford. It used to mean something. Yeah. And and now it's just it's just totally meaningless. But you know whatever hastens the decline of academia, I suppose I should be supporting. Um, so for the future, uh, I, I'm kind of doing these interviews for for posterity. That's what I like to tell myself. I, I like curate this yeah. uh, my interviewees um, in, in such a way. Like I I want to develop a, a set of directives for our audience because what i'm seeing a lot is this um i'm seeing a lot of anger and i'm seeing a lot of list listlessness which i myself am, am engaging in listlessness i i'm just like well i've you know i've destroyed my reputation so that i could do this youtube channel and i've been canceled and i'm never going to get like a normie job and my kids are probably going to have some social consequences for the stuff i've said online like what do i what what do i do what do i what do I do now? Yeah. <laughs> and I think my audience is feeling the same way. We're all like, we're tired. We destroyed personal relationships for this, especially in 2016. And, and now we don't, we don't know how to move forward. Um, yeah. We don't really have a movement anymore. So do you have any directives for my audience? Yeah. Um, personal relationships have been absolutely destroyed by this uh, within my own family. My, my son won't talk to me because of this and, uh, it's very difficult. Um, so uh, I think that that one one thing I think is to move to an area. You, I mean, there's some areas where you wouldn't want to live. Uh, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, L.A., um, Orange County, where I was. Uh, 
is a little bit better, but not, not really. And, and, and so there are places and I see people moving to Tennessee, to Idaho, to, to uh, other places like Florida even. Um, Florida, is, I think, has taken is a, a big influx of, of conservative-oriented people. I don't know if they're radical like us. But <clears throat> I, I think it's very important to try to find an environment that you feel comfortable in. And But, I, you know, I feel so sorry for people that have lost their jobs. That is just the worst. And, and, and they have no compunctions, of course, about ruining people. They, they wear it as a badge. Um, it's like, uh, you know... Uh, one of these gunslingers with their with their uh, hatches on their on their gun or something. They they're proud of it, and uh, it, that's you know the Antifa has absolutely no compunction, and and of course there are no repercussions now. Mm -hmm. There've been no almost no prosecutions for what happened for an entire year, summer, four or five months in two thousand twenty. And uh, still happening, including you know the the most egregious one is when they when they were trying to get into the White House and yelling Lynch Trump and all that. I mean, talk about an assault on the government. Mm -hmm. but now everybody's freaking out about about January sixth. Where you had a bunch of retired people wandering around the Capitol. I mean, it was like ridiculous. <laughs> I know. I mean, God. And now they're going to publicize it prime time. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, just in perpetuity. So, Pure propaganda. Do you do you have hope for the future of the West? I always have hope. You know, I don't. I don't ever get real depressed about it. I, you know, I I used to even back in the eighties. I got. I was not happy when Reagan gave a immigration amnesty, illegal immigration. But uh, you know now. Uh, it's always as a lot of people said on our side, uh, immigration is not even the problem anymore. They, they, that's, you know, even if immigration is not tomorrow, it's all baked in the cake demographically. Most of the children in this country are non-white, and um, you know, it's just a matter of time. So we have to have some other strategy, whether it's uh, moving to an ethnic uh, ethnic enclaves where we have power, control the government, and that sort of thing, and that's possible. Uh, and again, you know, you were talking about the collapse of the economy and a lot of things can happen. You know, those are the times when revolutions happen mm -hmm. when things change radically in unpredictable ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that's why the left has, has tried to purge the military and, and they've tried to get these local police forces under control uh, actually, you know, the point of view of the left, they want centralized everything. They don't want any local police departments. They they want everything under the federal government because one one locus of control. That's where you know you can control it very easily with the, your, your political apparatus. So we are headed to Big Brother if we don't stop it, and and uh, there's, no, there's no question. The surveillance is there. The um, I think they. Uh, the people who run the country are very happy with how it happened with COVID, you know, the lockdowns, the incredible conformity, the uh, fear that everybody had. Oh, it was so disappointing. I thought that we were made of stronger stuff than that. Even even two years ago, this just shocked me. Yeah. Within a month, I was like, this is all bullshit. And then uh, <laughs> we just saw everybody just adhering to all these regulations so for two years. I'm still mm -hmm. seeing people in North Idaho wearing masks. I'm like, what are you doing? Why do you even live here? It's like, can't we have one place, you know? So it's, yeah. just, it's just been disappointing. I mean, I, I've pretty much given up on converting the normie. If COVID didn't do it, then like something I say on the internet is not going to make waves. Yeah. It, it, I, I, it's hard to reach him, that's for sure. Um, very hard to reach him. Mm-hmm. And you know, part of the, the problem is the dumbing down of, of people. Uh, they don't read much anymore. They watch videos and play video games. And uh, they, uh, you know, I'm just reading this dystopian novel called Flashback. And it's weird. I don't know much about the author, but and he, I don't think he's a radical on our side or anything. But boy, he paints a dystopian picture where people are basically illiterate. And um, drug addicts everywhere, 
and disorder where if you're trying to go from Denver to New Mexico, you better have a, an army to escort you. Uh, and you know, that kind of thing, uh, the, things are totally unsafe. And um, surveillance state everywhere, they know everything. This is said 20 years in the future, 2030. Well, now it's only, the book was written in 2011. Now he's talking about 2030. So right. that's not very far away from now. And if the Democrats really got the power they want, they would do exactly all that. That's true. And I think it's somewhere in the the Western consciousness that this is happening, even with normies, because of the popularization, at least I can see it, because of the popularization of all this dystopian uh, literature and media. Hmm. Um, it's like the Hunger Games was super popular. Everybody got, got into like these, these zombie flicks and stuff. I'm like, do you, do you understand why uh, this is tapping into something in the culture? It's because we all feel that this is coming um, in, in some, in one way or another. Yeah. And I find that somewhat reassuring, but then people aren't preparing adequately. Yeah, Although what can you really do to prepare for a societal collapse? It's like you can get a year of freeze dried food, but then in a year you're going to be screwed. So yeah. we can amass skills. We can congregate with one another. We can find God. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. That, 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 that is reality. And this guy is projecting a future where, uh, you know, or you had the Reconquista coming up and taking parts of California, and you have the, the caliphate based in Iran, and it's spreading its tackle. Europe's already partitioned the Sharia law and all that. And the America, oh. the America, what is this called? Flash forward? Is that what you flashback? Oh, flashback. Well, flashback's in the name of a drug that you can take, and then you can relive all your any moments you want from your past. Huh? So these that sounds know. horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you you can ignore the bad parts and, and you know. Any, anyway, people become total addicts of it. But uh, anyway, how, how depressing. I, I, most of the dystopian things don't really talk about that kind of dystopia where you have Islamic law and uh, the, the horrors of mass immigration and that sort of thing. Well, you guys heard it here. There's no hope for the future. Everyone should give up. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Keep trying because, you know, I mean, I think your, your suggestion about the economic collapse, you would have to hope that that is an opportunity. And, you know, this thing about taking away guns is a scary thing because when the economic, everything collapses, the people who have guns are going to be in great shape. Because yeah, you're going to have people running around trying, trying to get right. food and all kinds of things. We may have food shortages this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. uh, the fertilizer. And this is, you know, Biden claims it on Putin, in the invasion of, of Ukraine. It's it's how we responded to it. Mm -hmm. We've got this neocons in the State Department, and they keep upping the ante. They mm -hmm. want to continue this war. They don't want a negotiation. That means fertilizer prices can't get to the West. Fertilizers right. in very short supply. Costs huge. And some of this, of course, is manufactured. I'm sure you've been following the explosion of all these food plants. You know, I think we're up to like 27 you know, now. <laughs> yeah, well, fertilizer people, plants, yeah. Who's doing this? Because it, it seems like it's, it's some part of a campaign of some kind. That's true. I mean, um, too many it, of them. I'm reassured by thinking about all the people that got um, just filthy rich during the Depression because they had some element of foresight. So our understanding of what's going on culturally right now, it has to help us in some way in future. Like it, it just has to. So I don't know, I guess, I guess we just need to get prepared. And I think that the most important part of preparation for an economic collapse, especially um, outside of finding God is, um, is mental hardiness. Yeah. Um, deal, being able to deal with difficult things in your life, with death, with pain, with grief, um, you know, and and having moral fortitude also. Well, so many Americans uh, have never suffered in any way at all. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they and now uh, I'm not sure they're prepared for a real period of adversity. My parents went through the depression. They got married right. 1929, I think, or something like that. Yep. And depression hit. Very hard to get a job. He's out of work for a long time. Yeah. Yep. That's suffering. That was difficult. But we do um, have something positive coming from a post-suffering society. What is that massively overused phrase? Hard times create strong men, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, but that that is what is coming. I mean, there's going to be a correction. And when we come out of it, uh, there's going to be some sort of um, gender reset. Like men are going to be men again and women are going to be women again. 
and yeah. uh, things will be more difficult, but they'll also be more functional and yeah. they'll be yeah. more true to our nature, um, yeah. gender and otherwise. Yeah. On that note, um, thank you so much for the insightful conversation. I really appreciate it. It was such an honor to have you on my channel. Um, I put all of his information in the link below. Uh, this was Kevin McDonald. So th thank you so much for joining me. It's great for being here. And we can do it again. I mean, yeah, I, I would love to. Sure we haven't exhausted all the topics we've been talking about. Oh, no. I, I had tons of questions left over. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll see you soon. Okay.